Um, again, my name is Ray Billet. I'm the uh, court administrator for the Superior Court in Maricopa County. And I'm Patty Tobias. I'm a principal court management consultant with the National Center for State Courts, formerly the Idaho State Court Administrator for 20 plus years. And then before that, when I was just like that young uh -huh. in the Missouri courts, in the trial court and the state court. No comment, Ray. None, none is forthcoming. So those of, you, those of you who were not in part one, can I see your hand, uh, raise your hands? OK. So a lot of you are coming back for part two. And as we said, part one really focused on the elements of effective court governance and going over a lot of things and to build the foundation of why it's important to have an effective and strong working governance system in your court. But what we're going to do in this section is we're going to turn our attention to really what we're calling the, that productive pair and how you can be become and work towards becoming a more productive pair with your presiding judge or your court administrator. We have a presiding judge in here, so. Yeah, we're, we're gonna have to behave ourselves no, this session. I, I think, no, he's the greatest, <laughs> by the way. He's the greatest, so. Um, but but it, this, is, this session, is, again, is intended for you to consider how to build and improve that relationship with your presiding judge, which ultimately improves your governance of your court. And we're going to talk, uh, we're going to again, build a little base for that. We're going to talk a little bit about loosely coupled organizations, the challenges that they face, and the courts are a loosely coupled organization. Is that, is, for some of you, have you ever heard that term before? So Mary McQueen's paper out there is getting to everybody, right? <laughs> and we're going to talk about that and the challenges those impose, and then work our way into effective elements of the productive pair relationship, and then really focus most of our time on two things, and that's improve and how you build that relationship through, excuse me, role negotiation and decision charting. And Patty and I will spend most of our time on that. So let me pause right there. Any questions about uh, where we're going? I should have done this the last session. Is there anything specifically you want us to address that's on your mind right now? Because what happens with her and I is we get chatting and we run out of time for questions. So if there's something you specifically want to hear about in this session, please stop us at any time. OK, so I don't see any hands, so let me move forward. So as I said, courts as loosely coupled organizations. And these are the characteristics. And obviously, the folks that we work for and work with are involved in very, very complex knowledge-based decisions, right? every day in the courtroom. Additionally, there is a professional autonomy of all of our judicial officers. And I was reading, you know, this morning we went over, or this morning, <laughs> last hour we went over the uh, 11 elements of effective um, court governance. And I came across this quote, which you won't be offended. I know you won't be. But um, and it goes like this, which really sets the essence for this. In our country, the judicial independence means not only freedom from control by other branches, but freedom from control of other judges. And for the most part, and I'm sure our presiding judges can tell you that, that that's a difficult thing. And so that professional autonomy is part of our organization that just a few have. And we'll, I'll show you some comparisons here in a minute. But that's a very important um, concept. Again, accountability versus independence. And as an example, I think I made it earlier this time, you know, if um, we as a court system decide we're going to impose time standards, and what happens if Judge X says, well, I'm not going to pay attention to that. Can he or she do that in your system? Another unique problem we have from a governance perspective, and how do we get everybody, if you will, rowing in the same direction? And then there's also the unpredictable con connections. And I don't know, I, I really have learned more about this since I've been in Arizona because there's connections all over the place to the governor's office, to the legislature, to the county itself. And that is very, a, a very difficult thing to, and I don't want to use the term manage, but to get your arms around and understand it. Because certain judges who, I mean, in, in my situation, we have 98 judges, so I don't personally know all of them, but they have relationships with very important government officials that sometimes impact or could impact what we do as a governance and how we govern an organization. Any other?
from your perspective from courts any other anything you'd want to add to this no this fits everybody's court <laughs> Moving ahead. The only thing I would, yes, go ahead, please. The only thing I would add is um, some of the challenges with uh, dealing with Justice Partners hmm? in that scenario. Justice Partners have huge impact or great impact on judicial officers, particularly in criminal, where you have a district attorney and a uh, Mm -hmm. So, what? Anybody react to that? Is that true in your case? Your justice system partners or stakeholders have a tremendous impact on how you're governed or, or affect your governance. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Here she comes. <laughs> She's quick. <laughs> mm -hmm. I said that kind of falls under the unpredictable connections. In, in a way, but I, I see what you're saying too. There could be. Not so much a connection, but a policy decision. Mm -hmm. How many of us are impacted all the time by a certain policy decision? For instance, use your example of criminal charging of defendants. A new policy, a more strict elected attorney comes in, district attorney, and all of a sudden, what happens? You, we are reeling as a court system to figure out what to do with that and how to react. So, but that's a good, good point. Anything, anybody else want to add anything to this list? Please. Yeah. You said productive pairs, and some of us have yep. elected cool. clerks um, yes. in our system. So I, I think it's, I'll say trifecta, yeah. <laughs> uh, rather than pairs, since we're here, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think there's, sometimes it's even more complicated because there's a third um, individual in the mix. Do I have any clerks, selected clerks, or clerk employees in the room? No? Yeah. Clerk employee. Okay. What do you What do you think about what she just? Oh, go ahead. She's absolutely right, especially when it came to implementing technology. Ah. Yep. Voila. Because that was all within the clerk's purview. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good points. Excellent points. So I'm not going to spend much time on this, but just to give you an idea of this loosely coupled organizations concept, you know, we're we're. Not exactly, but you know, if you look at hospitals and the medical profession, or you look at higher education, we have a lot of similarities. You know, you have a lot of professional autonomy. In a hospital, a doctor has autonomy over that patient and can't be told by anybody. I don't know. I'm guessing that how to treat that person, and you know, and and so there's a lot of similarities with it. And uh, but just want to kind of get you uh, thinking about those types of organizations. Um, Ray, as you yes, can I back up? Last slide. Yes. Um, one thing that strikes me that might be a little different is that uh, for those of us that are in states where judges are elected, you've got mm -hmm. one more complicating factor where <laughs> oftentimes they may see themselves as accountable only to the electorate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, How many have seen that or have heard that in your court? <laughs> Constitutional officer, exactly. I'm a constitutional officer, and I'm accountable to the people, not to the organization. And that's the problem for government, the governance, if you will, is how do, how do you get those people in the government system? Yes, sir. Just to be, defens just to be defensive of the uh, judges. <laughs> Testing. <laughs> It's, it's, not just, it's not just the judges. It's not just the elected judges. It's also elected clerks in some situations. In Virginia, the, the elected clerks are basically executive branch employees, constitutional officers, and you can't tell them what to do, <laughs> which means you have to be very diplomatic. Yeah, good point. Anything else on this slide? Okay. I think I'm turning it back over to you, Patty, am I not? Well, sure. <laughs> um, so, we, you know, we talked about some of the challenges, and I think the, the Pam's point of, you know, we need to be moving from productive pairs, thinking about productive pairs, to sometimes the productive trio or productive the trifecta. Um, that's clearly one of the challenges. 
But if we don't have it, um, we know that we've got confusion and frustration. It hurts the trust. It hurts the relationship if we're not handling uh, things properly. If decisions are, are uh, you know, we're wasting time, if things aren't moving effectively, um, our governance system is simply not effective. And so we do need to move uh, Ray, to the next slide, if you've got the clicker. Actually, you should give Patty a little applause because I just caught her off guard. This is actually my slide. <laughs> <laughs> she did that very seamlessly, didn't she? She picked it but right up. But if you move it to my slide, now I'm going to take the clicker back. <laughs> well, I, I do want to say, ask one question, though, from the, for the audience. I mean, these are just some challenges. What other challenges do you see or do you experience in your court to the effect of leadership and governance in your court caused by just the nature of how we are. <laughs> Judge, what do you see? I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> well, I just couldn't resist. Never give a lawyer a microphone, right? <laughs> um, I, I would add to that list a lack of clear delineation of roles. Yep. Uh, yep. I wasn't here for the first session, right. so I hear maybe you spoke about that. And we did that, talk that was, about that. Yeah, that, that's yep. what I would say. Yep. <laughs> Anyone else want to offer anything else? Yes. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Not having a successful succession plan for judicial leadership yeah. in um, in working with administrators. How how frustrating is that to you? <laughs> Any horror stories on succession? Hmm? Anybody want to share one? No? I, <laughs> you want to get I see jump some I saw, No, I saw a lot of people <laughs> nodding. That's why I asked. What a, but, okay, we won't go there. We won't uh, rattle. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, Kevin. All right, so now I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. So there you go. Well, so what's important is to begin to build that culture, to really build the culture of trying to have a productive pair or if it's a three, you know, a threesome. Um, but there are clearly characteristics of that productive pair that I think we should acknowledge and should understand so that we can work effectively as a productive pair. Uh, you know, the first one they talk about the separate bodies of knowledge. Well, you know, I worked with five chief justices and uh, I can't even count the number of trial judges uh, over the, the years that I was getting seasoned. What were Kathy? <laughs> thank you. Uh, but, you know, my body of knowledge is effective administration. Um, the body of knowledge um, that the Chief Justice was most concerned with was, you know, the Constitution and the statutory and the case law. Uh, in Idaho, and you know, we 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 work differently. We uh, what we knew was so different. What we looked to was so different. Uh, the networks. So I was new to Idaho. That we talked about those unpredictable connections and networks. You know, I'd hear, well, he went to law school with he, and you know, they went to there, and you know, I didn't know anybody. <laughs> you know, I came in cold, and so that those relationships are, and the unpredictability of that and that separate knowledge were so very different. Different ways of looking at the world. You know, I'm. Oh, thank you. First time. Note, <laughs> note for the record, first the time freak. I've what had can I control say? <laughs> over the, the clicker. Um, but the different ways of looking at the world. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to look out. You know, I'm trying to look forward. I'm trying to be, you know, one year, two years, three years, sometimes a little shorter term, one month, two months, three months. But again, I'm looking outward. My chief justice uh, would be looking, you know, again, they're trained to look backwards. They're trained to look at precedent. They're, you know, they, they're not trained to look forward. And that made a huge difference. Um, I'm a problem solver. Um, I, you know, I'm trying to identify the problem. I am trying to solve the problem. I'm trying to understand the nature of the problem. That's not always the training and perspective of a chief justice or a presiding judge. Um, 
but as we move forward, uh, you know, we do try, if we can have that basic understanding, that basic respect, that basic value. Um, and we don't always have it, let's admit it. Um, we don't always have it in each of those relationships. But we have to keep trying to move in that direction. And we'll talk about some of the challenges, <laughs> what happens when you don't have that basic respect for each other or on one side or the other. Um, another true important value in that productive pair is that shared sense of mission. If we're not trying to go in the same direction, if we're not trying to accomplish the same objectives, um, we're, we're not going to be a productive pair. We have to come together uh, to have that kind of uh, relationship. Some of the other, um, you know, uh, as you move toward a productive pair, <laughs> you know, it takes time. Any relationship takes time. Um, it, you know, whether it's at the work, <laughs> work front or your neighbors, or it doesn't matter. Every relationship takes time and work. Um, the relationship with, um, between court administrators and judges or other, quote, productive pairs, you have to work at it, and, and it does take time. And so as you think about your relationship with your other productive pair, um, think about, okay, well, how long have I been in that relationship? You know, did the new judge just get appointed, or have we been working on it for three months or three years? Obviously, if you have more time um, to develop that relationship, you're likely going to be more productive. Um, and then that trust uh, and communication. A productive pair has to have trust in their uh, uh, other <laughs> productive pair. Um, I used to say, oh, this is on camera. I won't say which chief justice. <laughs> um, but I used to have. Um, a very frank and open, com or frank and private conversations with one chief justice. I, you know, I had to tell that chief justice so many times. Oh, please don't do that. <laughs> you know, please don't do that. Let Let's talk about a different approach or a different strategy. But we had the basic trust within each other that I could say those things privately. I could say when the emperor did not have the, his, clothes, his or her clothes on. Um, but we have to be able to build that trust in the relationship to have that kind of conversation like, this is all wrong, and here are the reasons why. This is why we shouldn't go in this direction. But if you don't have that basic trust in each other, you can't have those conversations, and therefore the decision making or the decision that's being made might not be in the best interest of the court, might not be the best decision um, that can be made. And then, of course, one of the key elements is trying not to get separated, you know, where one person goes to that person, the other person goes to the judge and gets whatever answer, <laughs> you know, they want. It requires that productive pair, again, in this context, we're talking about the presiding judge and the court executive, it requires that they know who's making what decision or that they're going to talk together. Well, let me talk to Patty. I'll get back to you. Let, you know, or let me talk to the Chief Justice. And that there's that kind of communication between the both uh, of the productive pairs. Other characteristics that you guys think about? Um, what has been your understanding? Are those some of the key facets of having that productive relationship? The trust, the trust, the interdependence, again, that you're working together as the team, the collaboration instead of, again, sometimes I've seen that competition uh, between the judge. I'm, I'm in charge here. 
I'll make those decisions. I've seen it actually both ways. The, the court administrator, ah, that is my turf. That is my territory. You can't have that <laughs> if you're going to have a productive pair on either side. Um, we talked to judge clear and formal role definition. If there's not clarity on who's going to make what decisions, which are joint decisions, you're going to be going, it, it creates mistrust, it creates conflict, it creates wasted time, it creates all bad stuff <laughs> that you don't want. Um, and then, of course, the communication that we talked about, and that's the, at the very basic level is that trust in communication. Okay, so we're going to talk about two skills, um, role negotiation and decision charting. And these are both skills and processes that will help you for you to take back uh, to your court and work on. So we're just going to divide them up and, and uh, take a few minutes to talk about both of those. So hopefully you can take them back. They'll have a practical impact uh, on, on your day-to-day -day existence. So uh, first, Ray is going to talk about role <coughs> negotiation, and then I'll walk through decision charting. They both are truly helpful tools that when, we, when you practice them, I think will just become part of your day-to-day -day governance. You, won't even, you don't even have to call them anything. They'll just be integrated into <laughs> how you operate day-to-day. Uh, -day. You don't think so? Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. So I don't want you to go home to your presiding judge or your court administrator and said, Ray said we need to negotiate on our roles here. <laughs> How well is that going to go over in most of your environments? No well, right? <laughs> but I use the term because it is a bit of a, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure the word negotiation is the best word, but it's the best word we have right now. But it's a technique that you can use um, in your work with your presiding judge to really clear, and its, its purpose is to clarify what are the roles. How many of you been in situations where you thought maybe it was your role, and it turned out not to be. <laughs> really? And so what happened? <laughs> <We're playing. laughs> Yo, we're going to get run over, weren't you? <laughs> uh, uh, what else? You know, this happens because a lot of times, and we all have our ways of, you know, of doing our business, and uh, particularly for me having the ability and, and the opportunity to work with so many presiding judges. I mean, I said I, I went through this unofficially, as I said to the last group last uh, hour, that I've been doing this probably for 25 years. I just never called it that or never thought about it that way. But you sit down and you go over this and try to figure it out. And as I also mentioned last time, for me personally, the culture was such a shift in, in figuring this out. And so it helped me figure out not only just what my role was, so what are my certain behaviors that maybe are no longer acceptable here that they were when I worked back east. Um, a little example, I know of my first judicial executive council meeting with the presiding judge. I didn't know I was supposed to sit right beside him. I was at the other end of the table, way down there. I found out after that meeting where I was supposed to be. <laughs> Next <laughs> time. Now that's not a role, but that's a behavior. And so you can use this not just for your roles, but what is the behavior expected of you in certain situations? So, oh, you've moved it on. So, I'm trying but, to kind of. <laughs> she's good. But first, let's just talk a little bit about what, why we think it's so important. Well, first of all, it enables that productive pair, those, that presiding judge and administrator, to work across those personal and role differences, to, again, as I said, to clarify expectations of what, you're supposed, what you expect of me. And let me be honest, what I expect of you. I mean, it is a two-way street in this, in this business. And so we have to have mutual expectations that I can rely on in this situation, this is what or how we're going to handle it or, or so forth. So it allows us to do that and make a stronger working alliance. And again, the, the informal agreements and expectations that often uh, um, impact our relationship. Because you can't put a relationship on a piece of paper and say, do, 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 and it's all going to be great. There's informal things about me. Like I might walk into Judge Bryce and he said, you got to get rid of that facial hair. It looks like crap. 
<laughs> That's an, he, would, he would too. But, <laughs> but j just as an example, um, and so, and how we, that, again, that, that, that influence how we do our job. So this is why it's important to do that. Yes, please. The other, go ahead. I just want to raise when you're, you're talking about informal, but mm -hmm. in formal situations where I just kind of want to know if other courts or other jurisdictions outside of California, if it's a practice of the presiding judge to do formal delegations to the court executive officer or to the court administrator. Well, I think, uh, I mean, do I have a written document to tell me that I take care of this? I, no, I don't. I mean, um, and I know even in California, I think there's some, the court exec gets some authority via statute. Mostly a statute. So they don't even, no offense, they don't even need this, this guy. They can do it because they have the authority to do it. They don't have to get that. So I know that's different than most, organ I don't know, does anybody else, any other state have spe specific statutory authority and autonomy of the court administrator to do certain things? Anybody? As a state court administrator, yeah. I had the statutory authority to do X, As a state court administrator. But I know in California they do, because I envy yeah. you. But, but often, <laughs> the, judicial, the presiding judge will delegate some of his or her authority yeah. to the court exec, to the court right. Yeah. Uh, and and I'll speak writing, only for me? Uh, uh, it, it must, in, my, writing. No. in writing. I, it, no. Yeah. No. In is writing informal, is totally opinion. appropriate. Does any court administrator have a... Uh, formal delegation of authority, sir? Yes, yeah, so again, this gets back oh, to the, the Virginia. Uh, we don't really have that many court administrators. Almost all of the authority at the yeah, general jurisdiction yeah, level is, is elected clerks, and they definitely have constitutionally defined as well as statutorily defined authority. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it's an uh, issue. And the other, I forget what I was saying, but did, did I answer your question, though, that, that you were looking for? Yes. Okay. Um, and again, to come back here to role negotiation a little bit, and, and this is a day, I'm not telling you that this is easy as peasy. There's, there's danger and there's risk to sitting down and negotiating what you're doing. You went too far, back up please. See, she gets a little power, and what does she do? <laughs> come along, come along, come along. <laughs> when we talk about negotiation in this, we're assuming that most people, in the, most people in this would be you and your presiding judge um, prefer a fair negotiated understanding about roles rather than a state of uncertainty or unro uh, un unresolved conflict. And you can read this. I'm not going to read it out. But it assumes that you have two people who are willing to do that. Let's do this. Let's sit down and go through this. And we understand that the outcome is not only better for the both of us, it's better for the organization because, again, it goes to clarity. Go ahead. So we're doing a little role negotiation <laughs> practice in front of you. I control and uh, the I, clicker, and I'm trying to move him along. <laughs> Ray, if you'd move a little bit faster, okay. then I will click accordingly. Go ahead. <laughs> As you can tell, we've worked together a few times, Patty and I have. <laughs> but we have fun. Anyway, and rule negotiation, again, is focusing on the task. Not about your job, about the task at hand. You're not negotiating what your job is as a court administrator or a presiding judge. You're, you're negotiating over the task. And so be specific about that. Um, and obviously, in any relationship, I'm sorry, sir, um, relationship you have, a positive relationship you have, you have to provide honest feedback. We know in our roles as court administrators, sometimes we've got to be careful with how we phrase that, but you need to do it. And that was, that's what really builds the best um, relationships. Go ahead, please. I'm going as fast as I can. Uh, <laughs> um, and again, these are the role negotiations, is obviously being specific. Um, never, as I just mentioned, and at least in my opinion, you're not negotiating over general terms. You want to be as specific as you possibly can so there's no confusion about what you're talking about. Key here is, again, do not give the impression, if you're the administrator, that you are somehow passing some judgment that that presiding judge, he or she, really isn't doing this task very well, <laughs> so you need it. 
it should be with you. That's not why you want to be there, and that's not going to get you um, least sort of clarity on it. Again, or the motives of that other person. You want to stay away from that as much as you can. And again, it, this is a lot of this is just common sense, but timeliness is important. If you let, if there's an issue that comes up that should, in your opinion, hey, this is a great thing to for us to roll negotiate in the future. But if an issue happens and you wait too long, you lost it because the the importance of it is going. You know, if, if you wait a month, they'll say, well. You know, you start talking about it then, the answer will be, well, wait a minute, we got through it. It was 30 days ago. There's no, no need to do that. So um, timeliness is a really important in, in role negotiation. How do you do it? How do you role negotiate? And by the way, these aren't questions. I don't know where the word question came from, but I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I'm not a very good proofreader, just so you know. So you'll see these are not questions. These are they're basically statements that from your perspective, or even the presiding judge's perspective, this works, that you can use to, to facilitate discussions. What can you do more of? What can you do less of? And what do you, are you doing that is great, that allows me to be as effective in my role as possible? The way to frame it, because that is not, that's not um, aggressive. I don't think that's confrontational. It's just a way to frame the role negotiation to begin. And you can use any, you know, I need you to be less involved in budget preparation or anything like that, but, and, and the reasons why. Um, and so these are the types of statements you can use to facilitate the discussion with your presiding judge and court administrator. Unfortunately, Judge, I know you're a court administrator. I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> uh, don't tell him I said that. <laughs> All right, moving ahead. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, the, the more of, the, you know, I always think about it in terms of the more of, less of, the same. Um, those kind of communications with your presiding judge in most of our instances really do require that fundamental trust and communication to have. You know, so you don't go in the first day on the job or early on till you've got the lay of the land and start doing that role negotiation. But once you start you know, doing it as just kind of a regular thing, a regular practice as you need to. You know, if you're working with a new presiding judge, again, judge, it really helps me mm -hmm. if you, you know, tell me about that conversation, you know, tell me about any of those conversations you have. Or judge, it would really help me if uh, you had, a, if you heard from a legislature, a legislator, if you'll let me know. Judge, you know, and so, I, I would just kind of incorporate it into my regular dialogue. Yeah, Hold on. we've got one over here, oh, yes, Kathy, yes. sorry. Please, uh, Tina. Can you just talk to me? <laughs> come, come. <laughs> I think it would be a little more helpful if you actually start with saying, especially if you're in new and oh, dealing with, with a yourself. new, start yeah. with yourself. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to establish this relationship with my, my my presiding judge and say, hey, I'm, I want to really be more effective and helpful in this situation. Why don't, if, if you could do this more or less. And right. just okay. starting with yourself instead yeah. of saying, hey, when you do this, that might cause a little, and somebody in the earlier session said, how do you, if you have some conflict, always approaching saying, I want to work on our relation, or I want I want us to be on the same page, and just using those types of things where you put yourself first. Right. Always use the I or I me word. feel. Yeah, yeah. You're where you're coming from. I think that really helps. So before I turn it back over to Patty for the decision charting. So if, as you look at this, have any of you formed any statement in your mind that you want you're thinking about going back with? Somebody has to. So what would you like your what would you like your presiding judge to do less of? I know I'm picking on you. <laughs> what would you like your presiding to do in that way, and how would you do it as a negotiation? I can't think of a less of, but just more, okay. more of, um, just more communication about the outside conversations that impact yeah. you know, my role. So. Mm -hmm. And how would that make you more efficient? Um, just being in the know and knowing what the expectation is. And do you have a recent example of where 
I, I'm just, I'm, what I'm doing is just kind of step you through it when you're thinking about doing this. A recent example where you could point out if I would have known this. <laughs> I know, it's tough. It's tough. <laughs> what I'm trying to just demonstrate to you is the, is the process your mind to go through it. I didn't mean to pick on you. You're very good. Um, the process to go through your, and your steps that you go through when you're going to form your questions and what you should be thinking about and how to phrase it. Um, anybody else anybody want to share anything else that they may have come up with? Yes. I should just keep it in my hand, shouldn't I? <laughs> Not that it happens at my court. <laughs> 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 but um, things like when a judicial, when the presiding judge gets involved out of the goodness of his or her heart <laughs> in a personnel issue. Um, mm. Judge, I am trying to protect you. I am trying to protect the court. You know, conversations mm. like that that may be a little um, complicated or, or difficult if you start with things like, I am trying, in an effort to protect you, you mm -hmm. as a judicial <laughs> officer and personnel issues, um, because you are not, you, you know, if there was a lawsuit or something, you would not have judicial immunity. I want to protect you. Good point. Excellent. Good. Anybody else want to share anything? Okay, let me okay. turn it back over so to Patty. So we'll talk, uh, again, I hope that role negotiation gives you some ideas on how to uh, build that communication among the productive pair. <laughs> We're going to talk about decision charting, um, kind of a weird word or weird two words, but it really helps. Um, you know, to me, governance is all about making decisions and how decisions get and made. And decision yeah, charting yeah. is a way to really think about who needs to be involved in the decision making and what is their role in making no, that in decision. And so to me, decision charting um, clarifies the role. You know, we always go back to clarifying the role and responsibility, who does what. It makes you think about who should be involved at what point in the decision. Um, it helps you think about uh, that process uh, because decisions are not just, you know, snap and, and do it. It takes involving, uh, engaging, and in, uh, permitting uh, meaningful input. Um, where do you need to involve? Who else do you need to involve? It really, good decision making uh, promotes the fairness and advances, you know, a, a good process. And so decision charting talks about three different things. First is, who needs to be involved in that decision? Um, what do they think their role is? Uh, what should their role be? And uh, then also, what's the decision need, needing to be made? And so, again, it's very simple, just those three elements. Who, who needs to be involved? What's their role in being involved? And what is the decision that needs to be made? So they, they put this chart together, and it is really a good way to think about decisions. So they, they call it RACI or R-A-C-I. So think about it in terms of who needs to push, who's responsible for making sure a decision is made. Who's responsible for, you know, pushing it through the system, for really, you know, shepherding it um, to where it needs to go? A, who needs to approve that decision? Who must, uh, again, either say, yes, we're going to go in that direction, or no, you know, forget that, or, you know, take it back and, and reconsider? C is, who needs to be consulted? Who needs to be asked in a meaningful way? And again, it has to be meaningful. It can't be, you didn't really want to do that, did you? Um, it, it truly, you know, think about it in a, a meaningful way. Um, ask them what they think about this decision. So who needs to be consulted? So that's the C. And then the I, after the decision is made, 
who needs to be informed? So who do you need to tell after the decision is made? Not before, the, the consult is before decision is made, but the I for being informed is after the decision is made. And then who uh, you know, really doesn't have a role in this particular decision. So if you think about the RACI, who's responsible, who needs to approve it, who needs to be consulted ahead of time, and then the I is who needs to be informed after. So one example, and there's obviously every decision. Um, so let's just kind of work through a decision. This one was to approve the use of electronic recording uh, in your family department. Okay, so that's our decision that needs to be made. Who, who do you think is responsible for making sure that that decision gets moved forward? Who's responsible for it? I would say the court administrator would be my judgment. Anybody have a different thought? Okay, so the court administrator, you know, they say A or an R. I would say the court administrator is responsible. Who needs to approve that decision? All judges or the presiding judges? You know, again, it's going to vary in each court. Huh? <laughs> yes, yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so. How many would say no, not all the judges? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is how you're structured. That's right. why this it, is, it, decision no charting right. is so important yeah, because there, we're all different in the it, way we approach this. That's why this charting is a, an important exercise. Because yeah, and, and yeah, there's no, yeah. oftentimes there's not a hard and fast right answer or right. wrong answer, but it's a method of you thinking about it. So before we get to the decision, what? you've thought about who needs to be responsible for moving it. Who needs to approve it? Who needs to be uh, consulted about it? And then who needs to be informed about it? Yeah. I was just responding to the question. In our jurisdiction, I would say all the judges would be consulted, but ultimately it would be the presiding judges to yep. approve it. Yep, yep. What are you laughing at over here, man? Other, other comments, approaches? <laughs> and again, it, it's, not, it's not the right or wrong. It's a process of thinking about decisions. So let's do another one. Let's appoint a committee. I need a new. I need my new security committee. Um, who, who's responsible for that? I, I'm always going to take responsibility as the court administrator. You probably figured that out. Okay. So who who needs to be um, consulted about that new committee appointment? Huh? You're sure. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I, I'm interested to see the, the, the various of our cultures. How many people would say this group right there needs to approve it? Yeah. Security? Security or yeah, on this exercise. Yeah, electronic, on this exercise. You want to go back to electronic recording. Let's just go back to this exercise. How many would say, because you know there's no A there. <laughs> and we're going building these slides. I'm thinking, somebody get mad at me if I don't put an A there? Because <laughs> it, anybody, it still goes back you would to your be one? structure. Yeah, 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 I'm sorry. If you have court reporters that are employed by you, then possibly, yes, they need to be involved. But if you don't and you schedule them from a private firm, it depends on what goal is for the court. Well, I'm, and I, one of the things I guess, and maybe I'm doing it too often here, is I'm trying to demonstrate the importance of charting because we're all different on how we look at this. And that's why I wanted to see if there was someone who said, yeah, you know, Ray, I think our court reporters would have to be, give the big A on this before we move ahead. Some of you may. Um, and so I was just, that's what I was just trying to point out. But you're right. All of the answers to this, none of us will probably exactly match. Right. And again, why the tool is so important when you're going through, you know, who does make decisions in your 
uh, and who is responsible for them, who needs to be informed about them. So anyway, that was my. So again, using that process, um, you can talk, you know, with your leadership team about it. I mean, you don't have to actually write it down every time you're making it, or, you know, a decision is going forward. But I, it becomes second nature. That's what. That's the advantage of it. Just always be thinking about who needs to be involved, who needs to be informed, who needs to be consulted. How do you consult with them, and how much time do you give them? You know, you. It's a proposed rule. You know, how do you circulate it in advance? How long do you give? an opportunity for meaningful input, you, you know, all of those charting, steps. It's um, just good that. governance, and it's a really helpful tool. And if you practice it, just again, as a process, it will become second nature to you, and, uh, and it's a really helpful way to proceed. Any questions? Do any of you kind of use that anyway? Well, it's, you know, so you're, you can build your own little matrix at home. Yeah. Build a little matrix, and whatever the issue is, then use this, the presiding judge. But, and so you get a better understanding on each project, or on each decision that needs to be made, what has to be done, who needs to do it. Um, and again, it goes to better governance in your system and better project. It also ha helps with project management, I'll be honest with you. It's kind of the, the first kickoff of a project a project is doing something like this. So go ahead. So you know again I think we I think it's probably self-evident um, why both of these are important. Um, we talked in the first session how important it is to have that transparency in decision making and accountability. I used the, the reference you know I had judges um, that would talk about a a black hole uh, because they, you know, they'd send something to the Supreme Court and then they wouldn't know what happened to it. Um, for that transparency, it's very important in the accountability to know, okay, who's going who's gonna to be informed about this decision and really keep track of it uh, and really make sure that you know what the status of every decision is. Um, so we wanted to leave some time uh, for either practicing or getting out early and starting happy hour. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, or, or whatever our group wanted to do. So uh, let's uh, take some questions. Um, judge, should we is, give you? A, oh, I was going to give ju uh, Judge Bryce. Did you have a, one? A, give him the microphone. You don't yeah. want the microphone one uh, last time. Uh, just to make sure okay. again, like we did in the first session. You had certain expectations of what you're going to hear and learn today. Um, have we missed anything that you came in with saying, yeah, this is what I'm going to hear, but you didn't hear it? Yes, sir. For me, I think uh, this is like an affirmation of what we're currently doing in our court. Mm -hmm. So right. that's good. Yeah. yeah. That's good. It is. And it's more, and that's, now it's become more formalized. And like, I have a process that I've used for years with every new presiding and sit down and, you know, I, I will do whatever you ask me to do, provided it's not immoral, illegal, or unethical. I'll do it. <laughs> you know, but we need, but I, what I always asked for was a safe zone and, and to be able to negotiate the role and sit down in that room, just our room. I can say anything I want. <laughs> I can give you my opinion. You can give me yours about things. And while I can't tell you it's been perfect, uh, it's been a very good foundation for a successful relationship to allow us to go through, OK, you know, let's, let's talk about who makes the decision on this and why and so forth. So, but, I, but I agree. But it's not just becoming a little bit more out there. This is really what you need to think about doing as far as two specific tools, the negotiation and the charting. Yep. We had yes, Kevin. Kevin. Ray and Patty, hmm? one of the things that struck me as you were talking um, that I don't think is specifically outlined in the competency, but talk about the need for a court manager to be flexible. <laughs> um, you're demonstrating that yeah. and you're talking about uh, a lot of our systems being different, yeah. but for a lot of our governance structures, when we have, like, we have a chief judge rule where a chief judge can change every two years. Uh, mm -hmm. It may not always happen that way, but I, you know, Patty, you're talking about how many chief justices or chief judges you've you've dealt with over the years. You know, there's a certain 
I think inherent flexibility has to be. got to be part of our thinking uh, right. in so, this process. So I don't so, know if you have yeah, any comment it, it, about Kevin, that. Kevin, we, we talked in our first session about some general principles of effective court governance, and one of the points that we made is there's no one best system. Right. Um, there's no one right way to, to, to do this uh, effectively. What is important is to think about it and define it and structure it of what's going to work uh, for you. Uh, that that word flexibility, uh, uh, it, you know, I, I can't think of how many, I, I used to think I was so flexible that, you know, okay, come on, Patty, you know, <laughs> step up and say this, you know, but at some point, I was more concerned about the process, and if we, if we were going to go heading, if we were heading in the right direction, okay, well, we might not have gotten as far as I wanted to, but uh, again, that flexibility, as long as we were getting close and, and going there together, um, I, I was satisfied. I, I think flexibility is a key word. But I do think we touched, and I do think the NACOM core uh, talks about there is no one right uh, model that works effectively. But what's cool, I think, about the NACOM core, you can use it to teach, you can use it for professional development, you can use it for self-assessment. There are tools in there that help you think about what's going to be most effective for you. But I will tell you that I agree, and, and I've already had a little, well, I haven't had a discussion, but I think we need to um, update this curriculum a bit. And I was, believe me, I was integral in writing a lot of this stuff, you see in it now, I think we need to update it because some of the stuff we just talked about isn't in there. And that's integral to yes. governance. I'm sorry, oh, I thought, you, <laughs> I thought she was talking to me. Just but uh, taking your lead, I think we do have some work to do and I uh, met our new person from the center who's gonna work on this. To follow up on that, okay. um, we have updated eight now. Right. Um, it is on the list to be done, so if anybody wants to take part yeah. in the um, subcommittee on Ray, governance. Ray and I volunteer. Um, we'll, add your name to, we'll add your name to the list. Well, we this is what you get when you get her and I. You don't get theory. We're not standing. I don't talk about theory. I don't know what the hell it means. Right. I talk about practice and what it means to be in practice. And that's why we like working together so much. So if you're asking me to write theory and the history of court governments. No, but we'll talk about it. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it. I'll tell you practice practical. how to do it. You can call me, but I'm teasing. So. All right, any more questions? Question. We're at 5, 5, 5, 12, 5, 13. I hope you Another enjoyed it and it was informative. We have a uh, closer. One. No, I have closing oh. comment. <laughs> <laughs> closing comment. Make sure you go into the app and rate the session. Um, I mentioned it at the first session, but it's two separate sessions. So even if you attended both, please rate both sessions. And I want to thank Patty and Ray for the outstanding sessions. Thank you. Thank you.